have a hero of mine that's about to come onto the stage. Uh, not that hero. I have a lot of heroes. <laughs> this particular hero, though, is an American werewolf. He is a hot dog. He's a pepper. He's making it. He's David Naughton! <laughs> song before. Okay. Okay, we good. Oh, I told you we're well read around here. I know. Uh, yeah, uh, you want to <laughs> really? Yeah. Uh, a funny note. I don't feel like we need microphones necessarily. Can you all hear us? <laughs> Excellent. I like to make it as organic as we can. <laughs> Uh, for those of you making it fans, so I was telling David I was doing quite a deep dive on, on his career through the YouTubes, um, and some genius person out there uh, took the American Werewolf transformation scene, dropped the audio out of it, put making it behind it, and it's it's not like Pink Floyd, Wizard of Oz, pathetic, <laughs> but there's a lot of linear stuff. Is that what there. this is for? I, I, I tried to make it I tried to make it work earlier. However, if you YouTube making it not, you'll you'll see it. Come on, let's all get out our phones. <laughs> And I'll talk you through it. Oh, that would have actually been a, a good family. I don't I know. Uh, so David, you have not been with us before. However, your head has been with us before. Excuse me while I admire. Yes, <laughs> and it's cold. Cold oh, yeah, pepper. Sure. That's a whole other story. Go ahead. Back. Uh, Back to you, Steve. David's full corporeal body has not been with us before. However, when Clint Howard was here, he had your head on his table in an ice cream cone the entire weekend. We'll leave it to Clint. Uh, he tried to sell me that thing, too. I oh, really? Know. That doesn't surprise me. I go, either. Clint, come on now. Uh, so I like to run these things pretty loose. Um, I'm here to have y'all answer questions, not me. However, if you lag, I will ask questions, and I've come up with some. And they're not necessarily about American Werewolf, they're mostly about <laughs> other things because I know a lot about American Werewolf. Uh, however, another wrinkle, if you were to ask a unique or bizarre question that strikes me or David, uh, I do have a box full of prizes of moderate quality. Uh, <laughs> the more unique and crazy your question, the, the better <laughs> on the moderate scale your gift will be. Um, so without any further ado, let's, let's go ahead and start getting y'all's questions in before I assault them. Um, I wonder if American Werewolf, when you did the transformation scene and how it was just so seamlessly blended for, you know, great effects for the time, um, when you had to do the prosthetics and the constant growing, was that actually painful for you? Because it looks like if you're trying to move your jaw under that makeup, it's going to hurt. <laughs> well, <coughs> good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the makeup was... Uh, something that, you know, no one really could prepare me for, quite honestly. You know, Rick Baker uh, was, uh, just to backtrack a little, you know, Rick Baker and John Landis have had a, a relationship for quite some time, many of you probably know or read about. So when it came time to do this transformation scene, the thing that Rick asked John them for, because John said, what's it going to take to do this? And he said, I need time and money. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, the money part is really is more of the, I mean, he, he was, the budget for the whole film wasn't that great, but particularly for the effects, it wasn't that much. It was really the artistry and his, you know, his own artistic genius. Um, and then some guys to do it on, you know, to do this makeup. So I started, just to give you a quick uh, idea of how quickly we got this movie up, running, and, and literally made and released. October 1980, I meet with John Landis, and I can go into some details about how that went, which were kind of fun. 
But the fact is he was trying to get these two guys cast because Rick needed the guys so he could start the preliminary makeup, which is, was my clue, really, of what I was in for. Uh, when I first met Rick, so I, I basically meet John, I get the job, he says, you gotta go over to Rick's shop, which was not, it was like rented garage space, if you can imagine, in 1980. <laughs> Rick changed things a little bit after that, from seven Oscars later. But it was like rented garage space, and when I met him, he said, you know, which role are you playing? So my name's David, and I'm playing David. He goes, I feel sorry for you. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you what do you mean? So that was sort of my first clue about the prosthetics. And so we started to do, and there have been some scenes that have been added as you know, bonus scenes on different uh, DVDs of showing the makeup. And what was that preliminary stuff of having arm molds made, pretty easy stuff. I mean, you're stuck in there for a while, but when it gets to your head, it's a whole different story. Particularly because it's, you know, I mean, it's, you don't even have to be claustrophobic. You will become claustrophobic because it's, uh, it's, you know, you're in this drying cement, basically, inside of you. And uh, it's not easy for periods of 20 minutes or so. And um, they're going, are you, everything okay? Because you can't hear, that was the thing. You can't hear what's going on, you can't see, of course. The breathing is, is very minimal. So you gotta be sort of calm. And there, there's this Rick and these young guys who are basically apprentices for him. You know, going, and I said, have you done this before? And they're going, once, we did it once. <laughs> you know, oh, okay, so I'm experimental here, you know. <laughs> and and uh, so even though we did those preliminary th things, I didn't really know what the application of that makeup was going to be like and what the finished product looked like until we got over to London. And that was, uh, you know, so as I said, we met in, Oct in October. He's, we started shooting. In February, we finished in late March, and the movie came out in August of 1981. Wow. Last Sunday, August 21st, 1981. So it's 40 years this week. Wow. Isn't that crazy? This is what 40 years looks like. To <laughs> <laughs> looks pretty good to me. Well, uh, hey, thanks. <laughs> you stay right there, fella. <laughs> no, but here's the, no, but that's the reality was um, nobody knew. I couldn't call another actor and go, hey, I'm working with this guy, Rick Baker, and he's kind of quiet. <laughs> and, but he's a makeup artist. I mean, do you know what has he done? And what's it, what am I in for? And he said, no one would have said, run! You know? <laughs> because it was uh, it was unlike anything I'd ever done, I prepared myself for, and certainly since. Um, and in fact, I've steered clear of makeup on certain projects that have approached me, going, hey, you look good in a wolf suit, you know. <laughs> and, and and so um, you know that that was it. It was painstaking. Um, but mostly it was time consuming. And so you have to find that place where you just, you know, you can't get up, you can't get out of it, you're in it. So find that little zen place, which, you know, um, we shot the entire movie in 10 weeks and then we wrapped everybody and just had that transformation to shoot at the very end. So it wasn't like saving the best for last, it was really, we were still climbing up the mountain, in my opinion. You know, I wasn't over, I wasn't done yet. And I knew this was coming because there were other, you know, watching Griffin being made up and the process and the hours that it was taking him. And he wasn't happy about it. Well, he got really depressed. Uh, well, yeah, you know, I mean, he, he was funny because we talk about it and we think even like, I don't know if we mentioned it in the commentary, but, um, you know, we were both really excited about the prospect of being in a John Landis movie and what this could you know, do for us and our careers or whatever. So the fact that every time he worked, he got you know more and more de decayed, <laughs> kind of got to him a little bit. You know, <laughs> going like, gosh, you know, I thought you can't even recognize me. And those are not quotes, but <laughs> I will tell you a funny story that Rick tells, which is Rick's. Uh, so we're shooting, and you know, the thing is, we shot the first scene, all that stuff out on the moors that you see was coming in from East Proctor. Those are the opening scenes. Those are the first days we're, on, we're working. On, only because, you know, we're initially going, isn't that nice that they do this for actors? We start at the beginning. <laughs> you can sort of like ease into this role. No, it's all about the makeup. We're not gonna need makeup for a while, so. So we start those first scenes in the thing with the sheep and talking and all the little walk and talk on the moors. 
we're, we're jo- uh, Griffin and I had only just met. You know, we didn't know John Landis other than his reputation and what his style was like. You know, you don't know. I mean, I've been to England now. The good thing for me was, in terms of my comfort level, was I'd been to drama school in London. I'd studied acting at a drama school in London five years earlier. London wasn't unfamiliar to me, or the whole thing, the culture. And, you know, I knew my way around. Um, so it wasn't so freaky, like I'm in this foreign country and we're doing this movie, and is it a comedy, and are we gonna have a chance to read the script together? <laughs> you know, are there any kind of things? Because my background was theater, really, um, and there's nothing more really comforting to a, co- to a company of actors than to hear the words. You know, we'll sit down with the director and read the script. And so because you've only really been able to read from your perspective of what your part is, you know, as are like a lot of actors, just go through and go, where's my part, you know? Or the old line is, bullshit, 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 my speech, bullshit, 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 my speech, you know? uh, But it it really is invaluable to to hear the script being read and see the people that are playing those roles. Well, the thing was, John hadn't cast it. He was really, it was like, you know, seat of our pants productions, which I found out later, in the sense that, and he only revealed it years later. There was no, fu- the financing wasn't in place. The casting was being done because he needed the two guys, because Rick needed the guys early to start the makeup. He still didn't have the green light, was the money in the bank, you know. But he's going on, I'm John Landis, I got Blues Brothers, I got Animal House, we're gonna make this movie. He goes to London, you know, hires people to be, you know, all production, the entire movies, top to bottom, you know, British production, and all the people and crew that are involved in that. But still, none of the cast, it's not cast yet, other than, than us two, because we have to do the makeup. The Americans, and he's got Jenny, Jenny Agater, he gets, because they had history of previous films and things. And she's, she's a well-known, the most well-known of any of us, and the most experienced. Having start, you know, Jenny Agutter started it as a, as a, you know, young child actress. So when we get over there, it's like, who's playing any of these parts? Well, none of them are cast. You know, all those guys in the pub, you know, all the uh, Lila Kay, who's the bar maid, you know, all these people are either John went to the theater, in, which you can do in England. There's so much of what would be off Broadway. They call it fringe, and they can casting out of. People, David Schofield, who's the guy in the pub, going, you made me miss. <laughs> well, he was, he had done The Elephant Man in the West End. You know, he was The Elephant Man. So this guy is very experienced. Brian Glover, who tells the, you know, chokes out the Mexican. He, he uh, was a well-known, well-known-ish. Um, originally, a different actor was cast for Dr. Hirsch, played by John Woodbine who, by the way, is still alive and working at 93. I mean, I swear, I think it was the Avengers. Watch, see how I digress. Let's go on this tangent. I see, I, see, I think it's the Avengers. Uh, one of the Avengers, you know, one of those movies. Uh, I always say that. So, you know, there's an opening scene. One, Jenny's in one of these movies. As, as on, and the other is there's all these guys, and they look like they're in robes, like they're you know, religious, either, I'm really blowing the scene. I mean, no one's gonna say, that's not the Avengers. Yeah. Anyway, there are all these guys dr- anyway. dressed, yeah, dressed <laughs> as like cardinals or something, and they're panning all these old guys. And as they pan, who do I see? It's Dr. Hirsch. <laughs> there's, John, there's John Woodvine, this is about three years ago. He's still working, I looked him up, 93. John. So, does that answer your question? No. <laughs> the fact is. <laughs> Yeah, you know, he and he had he had a big TV series in Britain, um, and as I said, originally someone else was John was trying to get for Dr. Hirsch, and you know that's how what happens is you go after people and they, and then they read the script. They all want to read the script. You know, what's this movie about? You know, it, um, so and it was just so great. John stepped in and like you can't think of anybody else, you know, as 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 uh, Dr. Hirsch. So. The makeup wasn't painful, it was just tedious. And it was our job to sort of bring it to life. And there were discussions, you know. The idea is, is this going to be, is this like euphoric, is he in a dream? Is he, you know, he's conscious. He's watching it happen. And it's scaring the shit out of him. 
and it hurts, but he also wants to know what the hell's happening to me, and you know. So th those are all the sort of thoughts that uh, I had to work with as far as my hand stretching, you know. Oh gosh, you know, what's happening? Well, that's something I've always wondered too, from, from an actor's standpoint, how you approach something like that. I mean, obviously, you can't get too method when you're turning into a werewolf, but <laughs> it, is, it, is it so tedious necessarily with the special effects and having to get the lighting right and all that that, that you sort of slip out of? Is, is it harder to stay within a character? Or at that point, are you just kind of more concerned with well, yes, a lot of technical course. aspects? No, you know, it, um, from, from one thing, there was no escaping. Once I'm in this, started to get into this stuff, they were following me around, and you know, Rick's following me around with like a paintbrush, like the artist goes, he's getting away. You know? So there really wasn't any place for me to go, which is the part of that claustrophobic part where you got people working on you all day long, you just want to go, can I just take a break here? And well, where can you go and what can you do, really? You know, you're, you're in a stage of makeup. Uh -huh. But you know, for me, and the idea of it, well, it's a werewolf, it's the sort of undead, but I looked at it more you know, as, as a practical approach as this is a guy who's got a problem. And now I thought of it as, you know, what if, you know, think of like drug addiction or terminal illness. Uh, you're gonna not escape this. You're going to be told by your friends and people that you trust that you're not gonna make it. Now, who believes that right off the bat, you know? What, that was really where I was going towards. Like, so we're talking about werewolf, but let's take the word out and put something else in it. The terminal aspect of it, was uh, helped me in that this is something that you're in denial about. And so how do you play it? So the comedy in this movie really works against that in a way that people do. You know, they talk about gallows humor. You talk about making light of a situation that is very grave. In any case, even with people around you who you know you can't help and you're watching them, you know. So, so there's all those real aspects that you can tap into from an actor's standpoint and, and make, hopefully make work. You happen to be talking about, I'm a werewolf. You know, it makes perfect sense in the context of the show when you're, and that's one of the cool things when you're making a movie is that world you create is real. Because we're all, you know, even in if, if it's in an unworld, you know, we're dealing in subjects that are not particularly, but that's the real world. There is, the real world is the one you're in when they, when they roll sound. So that's what makes whatever you need to do okay to do, you know? Uh, uh, particularly, I've been asked about nudity. I go, yeah, in England, in March? Hey, I, I recommend it. <laughs> with, with wolves, <laughs> it's crush. Yeah, in fact, I look for scripts that require nudity. <laughs> but no, you know, or being in a wolf cage with real wolves, I don't know, yeah, the trainers are like girls this at their age just off camera going, they've been fed. <laughs> this is not going well. So How many takes do you do of that? One. Yeah, okay. That's what, that's what I was hoping you'd say. Yeah, one, one take of the wolf thing. But uh, so you have that real world, you know, that, so when they cut, now you're in this other world. It's like the make-believe world of we're making a movie. This isn't the reality. The reality is whatever we create when, when it's on. So there are things that I was asked to do that David Naughton would be very self-conscious about or uh, awkward and not, David Kessler would, you know, you get into that role, he can, he can do whatever he needs to do to, for the screw. So that was like when you can relate to a role like that. And it was written by John when he was 21 years old. Oh, wow. He wrote this screenplay when he was a production assistant. Now, a PA, is like not, it's the bottom of the ladder, you know, on a film crew. That's the guy that goes and gets the director coffee and does it whatever he can just because he wants to be on a set, you know. And that's when John was working on Kelly's Heroes, do you remember that movie? <laughs> and wrote this script because he was in Europe for this first time and eager, very keen. He's never lost that youthful enthusiasm. He's still like that. If you ever see him in a show, I mean, he's. Uh, has anyone. Did anyone check out uh, the EMP or Mopop yes. now? Yeah. Uh, we have a museum here dedicated mostly to rock and roll and other music, but there's a horror wing. And up until recently, it had the original Slaughtered Lamb sign there. And I, 
I called them because I was like, you're coming. So I was like, if you wanted to go see it, we would have you know, popped over there. And I, they told me that John Landis wanted it back in his garage, was the quote I got. <laughs> they borrowed it from him. He, they said it was in his garage. And then he contacted them a few years later and said he wanted it back in his garage. So I guess nope. that's where it is. That, it so remains. it's not there? It is not there anymore. I Otherwise, saying, I would have tried to get you there yeah. <laughs> as a reunion. Well, they had a few other props, too, like from the Nazi dream scene. Yes. And uh, they had one wolf mask. Yeah, and well, you know the mass and the stuff, all the stuff you made. You know, it's foam. It's it's it. You know, it, it degrades to the point of it almost becoming, you know, dust. I mean, it's really rubber and you know some of these appliances. But he was given a lot of it to a guy who was a collector. You know, a collector, Bob Burns, his name is, and he's a well-known guy in and around the Hollywood community. He says, "I will take care of the wolf." You know, it's like you'll foster. All these, <laughs> and he's had he's had artists come in and restore some of the stuff. I mean, it's unbelievable that he that he has. Um, and and uh, you know, so a couple of years ago, I'm over in London. Now I've been back to London a few times to do a couple of different shows, a couple of big, you know, of these of these conventions. And it's funny because I mean, there are a lot of different funny stories, particularly because everyone thinks I'm in their movie. <laughs> the English people, you know, this is our movie. Yeah. You're in it, but it's American World in London. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, okay. So this guy, so people bring different things, you know. Um, some bring stuff that they think is authentic, you know, and you kind of don't, you know, you try to not break it to them, like, where'd you get this? But, so this guy comes to me in it with a, you know, a, a wardrobe bag, he says, you, well, you know, and you got, I've got a line, and you don't know what people are bringing. And, and he says, you won't believe what I've got in here. <laughs> and you kind of go, no, I don't think I will. <laughs> Should I get security? You know, what's going on here? So he opens the thing, and he pulls out the red parka that I wore. And he goes, this is the actual, what did he call it? It's not parka. It's an English word. Anyway, I said, so where would you like me to sign? He goes, oh, no. I don't want you to sign it. <laughs> <laughs> don't bar it with your signature. <laughs> but tell him, what are you standing in line for? Yeah. So he didn't want me to sign it, to damage it. And the story behind it was, you know, after a film wraps, they generally let stuff that's, you know, any value clothes or things, wardrobe particularly, for people to, to buy or, you know, or, you know, cut rate if, you, if you're the size. So usually on the last week of shows, you'll see crew guys coming around going, what are you, about a 44 regular? <laughs> what do you want? Stop, you know, just what are those pants? Like, what, 36, 30? You know, I mean, literally, they'll buy the clothes uh, if you get some good stuff, you know? So this parka got, somebody obviously saw, because they're not, it was like a North Face or one of those. And the guy bought it, an electrician or a, gri or a grip, you know, crew member, started wearing it, it's warm. Really? Was on a movie, totally unrelated, working on a TV show or something. She goes, "Hey, that's nice. Where'd you get the album? Oh, this is movie Maggie Wow for London." She says, "I'll buy it off you." So the guy buys it right off the guy, uh, and it had some damage because, as I said, he was like an electrician, so he probably had some clips or screwdrivers or something <laughs> in the parka. It was damaged, and uh, she, you know, made some money. <laughs> sold it to the guy. This guy f gets it, brings it to me won't let me sign it. <laughs> just Damn. angle it in front of you? Just said, look at it. I'm going, I know. And then he asked me to put it on. By the way, it was two years ago, this is 2019. It was the hottest week in, in, on record in London that's ever been. They closed, the trains didn't work because of no air conditioning. So it was literally, uh, you know, and I was prepared for, could be a bit chilly, it was so hot. So this guy said, would you put it on? And I went, no. I'm not putting this thing on. You know, you won't let me sign it. Why should I, why should I put it on? So like you can be like, ah, oh, the old girl. Ah, uh, hello, baby. <laughs> I'm home again. Yeah, right. And put it on, and he wanted to have a photo taken with it. Which, to, you know, I went, that's not going to happen. I saw a hand over there, I believe. Yes. So how many days are So yes, the, as I said, we, sh we wrapped everything. We just had the transformation left, which basically means you, know, you let a lot of the crew go, and you're down to a, you know, not to say a skeleton crew, 
but you're down to a, you know, my, a small group, and Rick, and I'm the only actor, so it's you know, budgetary reasons that they're doing that. But that was a, f a week long process, you know, five days, 10 hours a day in makeup. I'd get up like a 4.35 a.m. pickup, go over and see Rick going, I'm set up for you. <laughs> you know, you sit in the makeup chair for the day. The first thing in the beginning, uh, you know, you do the transformation. Now they storyboard this, you know, in the way they make commercials. This is what this frame is gonna look like. And you kind of hope to, that it's gonna stick to that. But um, yeah, the first thing Rick would do is stick these paws on me. You know, so now you're done for the day going, there'll be no lunch. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're down to thumbs. I go, now the bathroom break? They go, that's why the sweatpants. I mean, you really, wow. so you're wearing sweatpants, and you know, and then we had this photographer who was a professional, you know, like a Life Magazine back then. In fact, we made this big Life Magazine uh, layout when the movie came out. I mean, this is talking about 1981. In fact, I have the copy of the Life Magazine from September 1981 that shows the first artificial heart is on the cover. <laughs> I'm talking about going back, and then there's an in, you know insert of this movie that's got some pretty interesting photos that this guy, Bob Willoughby, who was a you know, press photographer, but he was haunting us during the making, during the, you know, the makeup because it was so new and he wanted to you know, document this process. So he kept following me around. You imagine me, you know, I'm going to the bathroom, Bob, <laughs> you know, with my thumbs <laughs> and these paws and hair and all the hair was yak hair, actual animal yak hair that you put on strand by strand and, you know, sh sh spray it with this cold, you know, adhesive and cut it and all, all day long, all day long. And then you go out and well, now we're going to shoot. Mm -hmm. Now up to a certain point and then when I get, when the actual uh, the appliance, which is the body, is there and I'm writhing around on the floor, well, you imagine I'm, I'm in the floor. Here's the floor, we're on a set now. So there's room, so they can put me in the floor, and the only thing, the floor level is right here, and I can only, you know, this is all you see, and then there's this giant appendage. And so I'm in that, yeah, I'm in that floor for about five hours, one morning, you know, and at that time, you know, you're younger, you're going, I could stay in here all day, I don't care. <laughs> you know? But the reality is, hey, could, you know, so when they take a break, everybody left. Turn the lights off because it's hot. You're on a, you're on a, you know, and everybody just took off, and I'm just sitting there going, I think I can get through this. Oh. They come back in 15 minutes. How are you doing? I go, Oh, you're bad. <laughs> Let's continue. <laughs> so you know, it's, it's us, it really was. Uh, it was one of those situations that, as I said, you know, you're 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 at like day. As I said, it was a 10 week shoot, so it's whatever day 40 something of shooting. And you're only going to day 46. And that was really about all I kept thinking about was, don't quit now. You're going to get three, <laughs> three days left. This is the, pay, this is the big payoff. <laughs> What's, up, yes. What's your best memory from the production? The best memory? Um, uh, I just enjoyed, you know, there were a lot of things when we'd go out into London to shoot, you know, and many times what I never knew what was, you know, what we had permission to shoot, you know, um, because, you know, you're supposed to have all sorts of, you know, permits and things, and they have all that with parking. And, but then when you come out there, because I remember in the zoo, for example, we're in the Regent's Park Zoo, and this is the scene where I'm, I've, I've left the wolf cage, and I'm running naked, and I grab this coat off a lady, you know, and steal the jacket, run, and then there's the balloons, this whole scene takes place in the zoo. So at the one point, it's cold too. I'm telling you, it's you know, it's Seattle chilly, <laughs> and you're you know, fifty something degrees or forty something, and you got to run like it's you know, like you're out for a jog. And I look over and I go, why do we have all these extras over here for this scene? And they go, those aren't extras. The zoo's open. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no. Damn, damn, I, this is before cell phones. You can't, can I call my agent? 
I'm going to have me a pepper. Please Come on. do. <laughs> so, you know, that's one of those. But, you know, another time Griffin and I were, and we were supposed to, you know, no, do not go out if you're in makeup. You know, this is, so Griffin was always in makeup. So we're down in Piccadilly, and there's that scene where he's waving to me, going, you know, come on in, come on into the porn theater. Well, he's in serious makeup, and I had some makeup on that was not, so we go out, we start, let's just walk around like we're just walking across the street, you know, because they're doing something set up, so I said, come on, we'll go out. Well, we'd freak out, you know, freak out. People, you know, on the street in Piccadilly Circus, and you see this corpse coming at you. <laughs> that was, you know, stuff like that was fun. I had one time, I, I had all this hair on my chest, and you know, so we I left. Let's leave it. So we went out that night, and I'm going, "Hey, give me a beer!" I mean, <laughs> literally pulling the hair off my chest. We did stuff like that because we're nuts and trying to impress Jenny. Sure, she wasn't going for it. Uh, speaking of Dr. Pepper and nudity, um, I was hoping you might settle in a debate or a conundrum. I, I came. So what happens? You drink one of these, your clothes fall off. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 the original panty drum. So you be careful. <laughs> so. I, no, they didn't fire me because I was in the. Okay, room. yeah, that's the one I was wondering because uh, you did the Diet Dr. Pepper commercial years later. As yeah. As I found. Yeah, and then in twenty, I think it was like twenty ten or eleven. They did a, Dr. Pepper, you know, became this traded thing on the, on the stock market, so they asked okay. us to do okay. a... I just watched this video. I don't want to oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Closing <laughs> bell ceremonies at the stock exchange and invited me to come there, and they were going to do a flash mob, you know what those are, with, and, I, and so they had like 40 of these kids that had worked out this whole routine, none of whom were born when I was doing these commercials. <laughs> They're looking at me, who's the old guy? I go, Back before carbonation, <laughs> I was selling this stuff. Uh, and you can find that video on YouTube. Yes, it is. Uh, you don't. Thanks, you don't look Steve. Percent comfortable to be there. <laughs> no, it was, you know, it's on the New York Stock Exchange, so there's no rehearsal. You're just going to go out there and do this. And they thought it'd be somebody had the idea, like, let's do an unrehearsed flash mob, you know, at, on the stock exchange floor. Which to get into the stock exchange, you're, it's like Fort Knox. I mean. Security is unbelievable going there, but it's a pretty cool place. And I went there. There was also this band there that day called Kiss, who, <laughs> and they had them. These guys. This was back when they were doing. A, uh, they had a like a one-year deal when they had Dr. Pepper Cherry with just a Kiss of Cherry. Do you remember that campaign? Didn't work, but um, <laughs> they had Kiss involved in it too. You know, so the guys were there, and I go, wait a second. It's going to take them two hours. They had to have a special bus. You imagine we're staying in a hotel that's, you know, four blocks. It's downtown New York, Wall Street, four, three blocks from the stock exchange. Kiss needed this special bus <laughs> because they were on their in in costume, you know, with their platform <laughs> shoes. So they needed a special bus <laughs> to go to the stock exchange. Uh, and they got over there, and then they wouldn't do anything. They refused to come out and do what? any of the flash mob. Wow. You know what? You guys suck. <laughs> not, not professional. <laughs> not, no. And, you know, the, but anyway, I wasn't too bad. <laughs> I didn't think that was that cool. Because, you know, you can imagine you're going to bring Kiss in for a couple of days. Well, and you had some pretty cool Dr. Pepper co-stars anyway before the Sylvester yeah. <laughs> Tweety Bird. Yeah, Sylvester Tweety Bird. Ron Guidry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, you know, there are other people that were Peppers, too, that... You know, Jennifer Grey, oh, he really? was, yeah, uh, Jerry Hall, Nancy Allen, uh, Joe Piscopo. I mean, these people are, you know, were all, they weren't who they, you know, became. They were actors, performers, you know. Um, and peppers. Yeah, and they became peppers. They were part of the pepper tradition. Which so, is known as bandwagon advertising. Though. Yeah, you know, well. It's, it's a type of propaganda. It was crazy because there was... <laughs> Uh, well, I don't go in about that campaign, but you know, initially it was Dr. Pepper was a regional soft drink out of Dallas, and uh, you know, so there was the casting of this um, the, uh, this new campaign, and up to then they were misunderstood. Remember that I don't even remember the jingles. You know, Dr. Pepper, so misunderstood. Well, now they wanted it to be instead of misunderstood, be cool. You can be a pepper. It's a totally different idea of, of changing. The campaign and it caught on to the point where uh, people were coming out of the woodworks after the first year that I did these 
The first one, you imagine a 60 second commercial and two 30 second commercials. Total time, two minutes. 22 day shoot. Come on, 22 days. And how I knew that was, well it's a 22 day shoot. This, because the 60s was a traveling commercial, it was a coast to coast, start in New York, end up in San Francisco, and sort of a Pied Piper idea of collecting people that were peppers, and, and the crowd grew. But that was required a lot of travel and going to real locations, but, and these other two 30 second commercials were done as well. But 22 day shoot, believe me, there are movies that you know are shot in less time. And um, so which tells you what commercial uh, productions are like. I mean, it's, you know, you have the whole day to shoot 10 seconds of a spot and you have the entire day and uh, just a lot of money would be spent. I mean, so I used to laugh at this going, you know, there's this guy, uh, Michael Jackson. I mean, who is this guy? He followed me around. I was doing Dr. Pepper, he's got to do Pepsi. You know? He says, I do American Werewolf, sure enough, he's got to do a thriller thing. With Landis. Which is Landis. I go, stop, follow me around, Michael, you can't be me. Uh, eventually you diverge past. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I hope no one, who's recording this, by the way? This is all, somebody's got to be. Well, uh, yes, we are. Oh, you guys are too? Oh, uh, okay. Just kidding, Michael's we can edit out any portions you would Just kidding, Michael's a stand up big fan. Big fan. Yes. Question? Yeah, I, I can still remember when I first saw American Werewolf and how mind blowing it was. After doing all of the effects and all the pieces, when did you first see the final project together? And what were your thoughts at that time when you finally saw the whole thing? Well, you know, uh, it's funny you say that because. What I regret was I got to see it alone for the first time. <laughs> so they set up a screening at Universal mm. to see it. Uh, because there was a number of post-production things. You know, we were, they were trying to work on the sound, and the growls of the sound, uh, of the growls of the wolf, and what the sound was going to be like, and how much distortion. So you know, I spent a couple of what they call ADR sessions going in and doing different kinds of growls and painful things. And so I w always wondered you know, trying to stay true to what was going on, uh, what I saw on screen, that it was not going to be, it sound too weird, like, like I could tell, because they were really going to doing it in post-production. So they, so John says, well, you know, I'll set it, don't worry, this is, you know. So, and he was talking about the music that he was going to be getting, and I had asked about that, and just in terms of what kind of things, and they were still, you know, acquiring rights to the different moon songs that we put in, which, you know, <laughs> it's a pretty amazing when you think about, uh, I mean, to this day, if you can, you hear Bad Moon Rising, what comes to your mind, you know? I mean, you don't have to be in the movie to have that come to your mind, you know, and, and uh, or Moon Dance or, you know, any of it. So, uh, so I saw it my, by myself, which was not the way to see it, you know? And I sort of regretted it because I was sort of taking, uh, I was remembering things that weren't in it, you know, just in terms of things or a moments, little takes, things, because we didn't get to do a lot. With John is a very fast director. He sees it, he's confident, he knows what he gets, he wrote it, uh, and unlike many directors who write their own material, that's a tough combination from an actor standpoint to work with a director who also wrote it because uh, it can be problematic in terms of, I didn't write that line, why'd you throw that line in there? You know, John was totally cool about any sort of improvisational things. But there was just moments that I remember thinking about in the transformation, so there was a lot to take in the first time, you know? And I didn't have an audience reaction to, uh, to help me appreciate it because I was there, you know? So with the difference being, when I went to see it in the audience, so we had an opening night in, Mad in Madison, or not Madison Square Garden, but uh, in, in New York, uh, Times Square, at a big thing. And I remember uh, two, two different reactions. One was, I'm gonna get to see it with an audience. This is gonna be special. The other part of that was, I've got my parents with me. <laughs> <laughs> my parents, you know, these nice, 
teachers, Catholics from Connecticut. I had to prepare them for this movie. So, but, but the, what I found was the way the audience reacted was totally how un, unexpected in many ways, having seen the movie already once by myself, which, as I said, didn't prepare me, didn't spoil it for me, believe me, but I wish I'd seen it for the very first time, you know, with a big audience, because, you know, things that they were scared of, that things that were frightening, things that were funny to people that weren't necessarily funny by the time I saw it cut, cut together. So, um, I mean, I was pleased. I really loved the music. You know, that's so cool to see. I was very interested to see how the tran transformation was going to be uh, and how that, you know, blends together. The performances in general, you know, seeing all the English people that they had, all the victims, that's my favorite scene in the movie theater when they're talking about an electric shock <laughs> and so on. You know, that was one of those moments that it's such a well-written scene. Um, there's just, uh, you know, it's very, it was very theatrical. It felt like, you know, it played like, a, you know, it will play in the masters as, uh, as opposed to just cutting in. And Griffin was a puppet at that point too, which, you know, Griffin was there, you know, doing the voice, but um, it was a very favorite scene of mine. And, and getting to see it with an audience was great because we'd sit in the back and watch people jump particularly out of a couple, one in the hospital scene where she opens the blinds, you know, and the guy comes at her again, and it's a dream within a dream, which has been used multiple times since. I think that was one of John's little special creations, and uh, so on. So, and then, you know, seeing how gory it was, because I was interested, because John was always going, put more blood, I want more blood! <laughs> Anytime there were guys or victims on the ground, or, you know, the wolves, you didn't see the wolf a lot, which I was hoping you wouldn't see, and certainly, um, Rick as well didn't w he didn't want you to see the you know add to the suspense, and so you know there was all those little moments to look for. Uh, anyway, hey, it's forty year old movie. What can I tell? You? <laughs> oh yes, I see you over there. Yeah. Outside of this movie. Um, no, I, you know, uh, that I, that I've played, that's a favorite? No, well, you know, there's, uh, I had a, a movie that I did, a, gosh, it's got to be 10 years now, it's called Brutal Massacre, is anybody familiar with this film? Well, this is one you can check out, because it's, it's written by a guy uh, named Stephen Mena, who did a movie called, uh, Malevolence, mm -hmm. I want to say, I, I don't know if anyone's familiar with it, anyway, Steve, did his first movie, and it was this malevolence, and lots of things happened on the, in the course of shooting this film. So he wrote this sort of spoof comedy called Brutal Massacre about the making of a horror film, and I played the director of that of this movie, and I'm supposedly a famous horror director. Well, the movie's terrible, but it becomes a huge hit in this movie. So it's a spoof. It opens in a Fangoria convention. We're, we're on a panel of other directors, and actually, Mick Garris, the real Mick Garris, the director, is on the panel, and and I'm there as my character, Harry Penderecki, the director of such movies as Brutal Massacre, uh, I'll Take the Ring Back and the Finger Too. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, this is a funny movie that we made on a really shoestring budget. Um, it's available, you know, uh, you know, and and unfortunately. I blame Anchor Bay, who was distributing this thing, for just you know dropping it, not giving it the shot that it needed. Because in this movie are people like Gunnar Hansen, who you know know you know from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, who passed away a couple of years ago, and this is one of his finest performances. He plays this deranged alcoholic Vietnam vet, doesn't give a damn. You just so unexpected if you know Gunnar Hansen, who is this quiet guy to play this off the wall character. Um, and Jerry Bednob from The 40 Year Old Virgin, who's hysterically funny, little Indian guy. He plays the director of photography. Well, he didn't even know on day one which side of the camera to look into. We're going, no, the lens is over here, Jerry. Oh, you wanna look in here? Well, he's hysterical in this movie too. Uh, but as I say, it's, it takes place, it's about independent films is really what it's about and all the little stuff that can happen when you're trying to make a movie on a budget, on a small budget. 
So people that have tried that particularly appreciate all the stuff that can happen on a shoot. So I, I would recommend that. And I had fun. Uh, we were thinking this could you know, spin off into all kinds of things. I mean, you could do a series because it's this madcap little group of filmmakers who are really incompetent. Or at least, let's say, <laughs> if they're not incompetent, their taste isn't exactly mainstream. And all the little escapades they go on. You know, or the, we thought is for the sequel of this movie is to take it you know, abroad, go to a, we're going to Brazil to shoot an independent film. And then one of the crew gets kidnapped. And you know, these, but, but it's a comedy. These madcap guys are trying to shoot this movie. Um, anyway, if you check it out, write the sequel and I'll do it, because I like it. <laughs> I guess I'm, uh, I'm curious about the flip side of that question. Is there anything you've ever done where, we were, where you were like, oh, I'm not sure how this is going to turn out? And then when it came out, you were like, oh, this is much more popular than I anticipated. No, I thought you were good. Where I thought this question was going, where there are always those duds, too, that you do, that you, know, you think there's a lot. And, and you know, the point is, no, but there's no surefire hits. I don't care who's in it, how much money the budget has. I mean, you can all mention a film that you were so disappointed by, the cost, you know. Sure. Uh, so there are no guarantees. Even if you put your favorite actor in the roles of a great director, they, there's still some duds out there, and there's no guarantees. That's why studios do lose money. Um, but then there are those that you kind of go, well, we've got to hope. We've got to hope on this one, you know. Right. And, and so some of the films that I've done, some of the smaller movies, I'd always go in with the intention of, well, what's the worst that could happen? Not the really worst, not in a negative way. I'm just saying that if you don't do it, then you never know what could happen. Sure, well, but if you jump sense. in and jump in on board with this project, this could either be a new director, which I've worked with a few of the new guys, who break out and become the next whoever, which is always fun going, remember we did your first movie, you know? Um, and I always like that. You know, it's sort of like doing any sort of new theater piece. I've done a number of new plays, new musicals going, new? No, what about established? They go, no, new is really great because you're, you're creating the, the role, the original part. That's what's cool from the actor standpoint is you originated the role. And uh, even if it's not a box office, you know, bonanza. So there are, and then there are those guys that you want to work with just to jump in the bandwagon. Sharknado 5 is one. <laughs> I go, what did I get myself into? <laughs> and you have no control over how it's cut. You know, you don't see, you go, then wasn't my part a little bigger? <laughs> you know, but there are those two. So you never know. Uh, the fact is, is, saying no is pretty final. Saying yes is there's tons of possibility. And, and I, at this point in my life, you know, it's fun to take those risks. Uh, this sort of parallels off that. Um, I may want you to lie to me, but I must. <laughs> uh, when I watch a, a bunch of your work, uh, I assume that maybe Hot Dog the movie was like the biggest party to film, perhaps, out of all of Hot them? Hot Dog. I don't know if it, people know the ski movie Hot Dog. You yes. better. <laughs> yes. Well, the biggest thing that came from that movie, a ski movie, is I have two children from Hot yes. Dog the movie. <laughs> what a party! <laughs> who, who are now, yeah, 35 and 32. And my uh, son and daughter. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, they could have made the making of Hot Dog, you know, as a bonus scenes. You'd <laughs> want to watch that. Because we were up in Squaw Valley, you know, shooting a movie where it snowed in 1983 or 4. I mean, it snowed 50 feet while we were shooting this movie. The producer was Ed Feldman, who went on to do movie, some big films, uh, a couple of Jim Carrey movies. and an Eddie uh, Murphy movie, but Ed was wringing his hands. This was a small budget film as well, um, because we kept getting these white outs, you know, going, we can't go out and shoot today, it's just gonna be another blizzard. <laughs> so, you know, that would be fun. But, but the point of that movie was, uh, you know, we were all dressed as skiers, as racers, you know, and the, you know, the premise is the Rat Pack plays the, you know, and the, and the Austrian team, or the bad guys, Rudy and the Rudettes, and it's two rivals, you know, silly little thing, and a big Chinese downhill ski at the end. Well, that's the basic premise of these, of these two uh, groups. And many of the actors couldn't ski, but we're dressed, <laughs> we're dressed as racers. We got bibs, 
you know, and a hot dog skier, you know, is a freestyle skier. You know, so they do moguls, they can do the ballet, and they also do the jumps. So I had a different double for every every kind of event. And if you and I look through the course of that movie, I'm like five six in one scene. I'm six two, three hundred pounds in another scene. I'm going, this guy dancing Dan, he he, gets, he blows up and down depending on. What the, st what the stunt was. Do they let you do any of it? or? Well, you had to see, the thing is you're shooting on a, on a mountain. You're shooting on the, on the slopes. So you have to get there. They're not exactly going to take you up by, you know, snowmobile. <laughs> so you had to ski to the location. Well, some of the actors are funny because, as I said, we're dressed in, you know, bibs. And we got the numbers on us. And these guys are going, slow it down, I can't get on the lift. I mean, this is when, so they were, this was all really happening. So they have to stop the lift, let the actors get on and take off going, you know, what's going on here? Well, this looks pretty funny. People thinking that, the, you know, the ski operators. But it was, you know, one of those movies, again, that did very well. Um, it's, a, it's a little ski comedy. There's, a, you know, wet t-shirt contest. Now, the other thing about this, I say that because these are all locals that live there. These are all people that wanted to be in this movie. And a lot of the ski stunts were from guys going, hey, you want to be in this movie? <laughs> yeah, I'll do that stunt. Yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> what? Yeah, sure. I mean, we had guys coming down, crashing through a breakaway door, skiing across tables and blowing out the back of the lodge. There's one scene where that happened, one take. Some guy named, <laughs> you know, some guy named, you know, Charlie, yeah, I'll do it. And these guys, this was you going, nobody got hurt on this movie. That's what's crazy about it. Um, and everybody that's in it is all from the Tahoe area. So, so that's become a big reunion movie. So up there, you go up now at the time, Squaw Valley, the mountain, the corporate mountain who owned it, when they read the script, finally, after we were like halfway through the movie, they were outraged going, this doesn't happen at our resort. <laughs> like, oh, yes, it does. <laughs> You're going up on the left, you know, and there's all sorts of mayhem. And, you know, so they were outraged. So they, <laughs> well, cut to, I went to a reunion there about three or four years ago, and it was like, welcome, the, this is where Hot Dog the Movie was made. <laughs> going, wow, they've changed their tune. <laughs> you know, so everybody's, and everybody that's, that was in the movie, came back to it. So they had a hot dog similar to like a Rocky Horror thing. Everyone's dressed up as your favorite character in Hot Dog and all the skiers are there <laughs> and all these stories. And my children are there. And it's like, you know, this, it's crazy up there at Squawk going, you know, Hot Dog is their movie. So when I go up there, they let me is hang out with them because they made this movie. Is it still that way there? It's still a big deal. <laughs> no, I mean, it's still a big deal as far as now, you know, it's changed the whole place. I don't know if any of you guys ski or have been to Squaw. It's kind of built up, and it's not, of course, nothing's like it was in the day. Very built up and very corporate. But um, there's still some of the same trails. And, <laughs> and, you know, this was a time when, you know, Sh Shannon Tweed, you know, was in this movie, and she was his Playboy Playmate. She didn't have the first idea about snow. I mean, I don't even know how we, we got her to be in this movie. <laughs> Uh, but what you don't see in their movie is her sister Tracy Tweed, who was like 16, six foot tall, wild child, going, "Who is this? Oh, that's Shannon's sister. You know, we, you know, she needs a chaperone. We're going to be on this movie for five or six weeks. You know, so a lot of that was going on. As I said, you know, Squaw Valley is down the road from from uh, uh, from Incline Village, which is Nevada, where you can gamble. <laughs> so, you know, the entire group on the team going, come on, and we try to find a car that had, you know, snow tires, because it snowed, and we'd be skidding down the road going to, don't forget, we got to work tomorrow morning, you know, crack of dawn on the mountain. <laughs> so we could have made the movie, making of Hot Dog would have been a great movie. No one was hurt. No one, I mean, some of us were not so sure about, you know, having a car, a little BMW with chains on it. Well, when you hit the dry roads, you're supposed to take the chains off. None of us, some of us didn't know that. So we're driving around, let's go down, to, you know, they're driving around on dry roads with chains, absolutely taking all the paint off their cars and going like, live and learn, you nutty kids. <laughs> <laughs> now, see, that's what I was hoping you could say. <laughs>
Yeah. Uh, we, got time. we got time for one more, uh, though I'm sure David would be happy to answer questions at his table in a more private setting. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I got some. Uh, uh, say, let me go with you since you haven't asked, asked one yet. All right, first you got, I have a question. Who's on the phone? Huh? Come on, come on. <laughs> go ahead, what's your question? A family member going, you didn't wear that costume, did you? <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, what's your question? Uh, do you still meet with any of the cast? You know, it's, it's one of those things like any project, you know, the first time you play a family member, I, I remember the first show, that one of the first series I did, the show called Making It, which we, oh, we did here, yeah. it was a series. And you're going like, God, we're gonna be friends for life. You played my brother and you played my sister. You're my mom and dad, and you're my TV. Well, no, as soon as the show's over, you're off, you know, and it's really, see, ya. it's too bad. I mean, you might run into people later, uh, but in some other instances, um, you know, it's just not, this, it's not what you like, not what you'd like it to be, but it's, the reality is, you know, you're all uh, working actors and moving on to the next thing. Now, John Landis uh, and, and Rick, I've seen, uh, at shows or at specific things, and we get a chance to talk and have uh, opportunities to sound and laugh about you know things or, or find out stuff that I think I mentioned to not you know, not re necessarily knowing at the time what was going on, which is always fun. Griffin, I've talked to Griffin Dunn, who's not really into doing shows. It's like I try, I tried. You try to get him, yeah. Time. It's like Griffin, come on, you know this would be fun. Um, we did one, and he wasn't like I need pictures. Yeah, I need pens. You're gonna need some pens. You're gonna need some pictures. <laughs> you know, you're not into this, I can see. Uh, and you know, it wasn't his thing, and it's too bad. But uh, and Jenny Agater is uh, over in England, of course. Uh, you know, I did see her. There's this show, The Midwife. I don't know if you people have seen the show. You see her dressed up as a nun. Like, I go, Jenny. You're a mother superior? <laughs> God, I remember you yeah, when, yeah. honey. <laughs> well, that seems like a good time. <laughs> Is that a good time? Uh, thank you all for coming. Please Thanks, to everybody. Give it up for David. If you ask a question, see me outside and I'll give you a prize. Um, and as I like to say at the end of these, please remain sane, at least until you're no longer our responsibility. Oh, that's very good. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers.